Uh, thanks all for coming here. Uh, so I'm going to just be talking about blue halite from Carlsbad, New Mexico. Uh, these came out a few years ago when people got really excited about them. Uh, Phil Persona and I were talking about this earlier, and I told him not to be too salty, because people like blue better than they like red. <laughs> So, like I mentioned before, these really uh, came into prominence in about 2013. Um, Paylight from the Carlsbad area has been known for a long time, but I wrote an article that was published in the Mineralogical Record in 2013, and it really brought a lot of attention to this particular deposit and the really cool halite crystals that we found there. Um, here's a few, a few things of stuff that happened that kind of progressed as people found out more and more about the halites from Carlsbad. Um, and it, it, it went, uh, like the rhodochrosites, it went uh, international too, so uh, Lapis and, and Mineral and Velt included some articles and, and some cover photos of the halite back when this stuff was really first starting out. So here's a picture that, uh, of a display case that I put together in 2014. I actually coordinated with Brian Lees on this. So you can see you have really nice rhodochrosites from the Sweet Home Mine, and then you have the really pretty halites as well from Carlsbad. So this is just really getting started and getting people to learn about the halites from Carlsbad area. So here's a couple of the cover photos that were published, both in the Mineralogical Record and Lapis. So it's, the, the, it's interesting, these two deposits, the Sweet Home Mine and the Carlsbad Potash District, are kind of studies in contrast. Sweet Home Mine, you got really high elevations. It was a tiny little mine um, that, that they mined ore for just a few years, and then it was specimen production, whereas the Carlsbad mines are very different. It's really, you can see the desert terrain and everything. Um, very kind of desolate, flat. Uh, it's very windy and hot during the summer. It's low elevation, so 31 to 3,600 feet. Um, and also, these mines are, are mined commercially for potash, uh, for the potassium, which is one of the three key ingredients in fertilizers. So just a little bit of the history and production of the Carlsbad potash mines. So you can kind of see the, the, the distinction between the small mine like the, the Sweet Home and the, the really large commercial operations like this. So uh, potash was first discovered in an oil and gas well in 1925, uh, so a little bit later than most of the other mining that was happening in the West. Um, and it was found in, in a, a well they were drilling for gas, and, and one of the geologists on the project, V.H. McNutt, saw these really weird kind of red cuttings that were coming up out of the drill holes, and he recognized it as potash. And so over the course of time, they decided that that not only could they get oil and gas out of this area, they could also mine potash. This was one of the really big potash fields in the world at the time. And so in 1930, they sunk the first shaft called the U.S. Potash Mine. And this particular picture right here, this is the U.S. Potash Mine. This, this picture is dated at 1932, so this was two years after they had started to work there. And then in 1934, the government actually set aside a, a specific zone called the Known Potash Lease Area, and this was specifically designated to mine potash because you can't have oil and gas wells right next to potash mines because of the safety issues there. So they set aside this sort of thing. And then one of the really interesting things about the, the history of this area is what is known as a continuous miner, which is this machine right here. This was first developed in the potash mines in Carlsbad. So this was a piece of technology, a new piece of technology that came about as a result of potash mining. And, and, and also, again, the contrast between the Sweet Home and the Carlsbad areas. Sweet Home mine is, a, is hard rock, and so it's all explosives, that sort of work. Whereas the potash mines, they're very soft rock. And so how we mine these things is you have this drum uh, on the front of the machine. You can see all the teeth, the nasty looking teeth. And because the rock is so soft, we rotate that drum and then just basically push it into the rock. It, it grinds away the rock and then spits it out of, of the back of the machine on a conveyor belt. So we can actually mine much quicker and in, in lar larger quantities um, in this particular method just because the rock is so soft. So one of the key dates here that, that I'll point out is the Kerr-McGee mine starts in about 1965, and this is where the blue halite comes from. Um, but from the 30, 1930s to the 1960s, New Mexico was the leading producer of potash within the world. So it was very significant 
producer of fertilizer type material. Uh, annual production uh, really peaked in about uh, 1960, like the mid 1960s. Uh, so 15 to 20 million ore tons a year. So these are very large operations. Um, and one of the, another thing I'll point out here is that underground, it's, some people find this hard to believe, there's 10,000 miles of tunnels underground in this one particular potash zone. Multiple levels, there's a lot of tunnels basically running every which direction. And here's just a map of the area. We have Carlsbad that's kind of off to the, to the west here, just off of the map. And then these are the major mines. This red area is the known potash lease area, which was set aside. It's also very close to the WIP site, which is one of the, the waste, nuclear waste repositories that has been used for the last many years. Um, and then also we have the underground workings on that map on the right. You can actually see the extension of this. So it's probably a little bit hard to see, but I'll point this out. This scale, that's 10 kilometers from, from end to end. And you can see there's just workings overlapping all over the place, different ore zones and that sort of thing. So very extensive workings. I'll go into a little bit of the geology of the deposits. I won't get it into too much because I know everybody wants to see the pretty pictures. But it is kind of nice to know some of the background of the, of the geology of this area. It's part of the Delaware Basin, um, which is kind of southeastern New Mexico, southwestern Texas, which is also a, a part of the larger Permian Basin. Uh, which is mostly located in Texas. And this happened as you had shallow seas would come and go and uh, they would evaporate because they weren't very deep. And as they evaporated, they, they basically deposited all the salt on the bottom of the basin, on the bottom of the pan. This was, a, um, and basically you had the, these were basically seas um, during the Permian period. And you have these boundaries. So this is the, the Capitan Reef, which is a limestone reef. And this act as kind of a, a uh, sort of a, a, a boundary for the, the basin, for the waters to come in. They would kind of hit that boundary and then they would stop there. And then they would, they would uh, evaporate and, and the salts would drop out. Uh, one of the other things I'll point out is that we're really interested in what is known as the McNutt member, which actually was named after the geologist that first found the deposits. This is where all the potash is located and where the really cool uh, crystallized specimens come from. Brief mineralogy of the area. Uh, there are two major minerals, like I said, we're mining for potassium, sylvite, and langbanite. Um, but there's also a, a lot of other gang minerals, halite being one of them. So we're not actually mining or did not actually mine halite uh, from the mines here, it was a byproduct or a waste product. We would just we would mine it and basically process it and throw it out on the dumps. So the miners were not interested in this sort of stuff at all. But some of the really noteworthy specimens uh, or species from this are ephthalite, which is a sodium potassium sulfate, uh, carnalite, which is a potassium magnesium chloride with some water, halite, which of course is sodium chloride, langbanite, which is another sulfate, and then sylvite. And, and the ones in blue that I've highlighted in blue, this produces, these are either world-class species um, or they are best of species uh, around the world. So now I'm going to kind of get into a little bit more of a storytelling mode. I like to tell stories. Um, I'm a field collector myself and, and a lot of people don't really get to see kind of the, the, the stories as they develop, how these things are found, what goes on during that period of time. So the ephthalite, which is like I mentioned, a sodium potassium sulfate, was first uh, found, I think, back in about 2011 when we were mining this particular zone at the U.S. potash mine. And one day, the mine geologist, who was a good friend of mine, I did a lot of work as a mining engineer, um, as planning engineer, and also as ore control geologist. I did both things. But the mine geologist came into my office one day and he, he just plopped this big, what looked like a piece of glass on my desk and said, hey, do you know what this is? I had never seen anything like it. I was really familiar with the mineralogy of the deposit at that point. And so fortunately we had a lab on site, so we were able to take it to the lab. It comes back as this really rare mineral. I had never heard about it. I had to go to Mindat and look it up and kind of figure out the chemistry and everything. Um, but it was called ephthalite. And it was kind of, it had a couple of crystal faces on it. It wasn't a complete crystal or anything like that. Um, but th I, I figured this is really significant. I've never seen anything like this. I know this is a rare mineral 
and I have this big, probably fist-sized piece of glass-like looking material. It's like we need to go down there and find it. Um, so that probably, I would say the next, we, I don't think we made it down the next day, but probably two days after that, um, we were able to find some time to go down there and got to the area where the miner was working. And fortunately for us, the miner was down with routine maintenance, so we were able to get to the working face and actually see where this stuff was coming out. So this is a picture of me at the working face. You can't really see it well yet. Um, I'll show you a couple of pictures, but we actually see some pockets. And one of the really unusual things about this particular area is there are very, very few pockets. Um, it's all solid rock for the most part. The only area where we found open pockets that had some crystals in them were these ephidolite zones. So we get there, we see this pocket right in the face. I started working it and the, the pockets start getting bigger and you can actually see a crystal in the middle of this pocket. That's probably about, I would say, close to seven centimeters across. And one of the cool things about the ephidolite, like I said, it's a rare mineral. Um, and I was doing research, looking at Mindat, looking at pictures online, that sort of thing. It turns out that the largest crystal up to this point that had been reported of this rare sodium potassium sulfate was about seven centimeters. So we got into this pocket, we're starting to find these crystals, starting to see big crystals. It's like, this could be something that's really special. Eventually we get to the point where we open the pocket up and this is what we see when we open this pocket up. Um, so you can see the really nice crystals here. Uh, you get really nice clusters, just really good groups with a lot of crystals just kind of going every which direction. We call it the sparkle pocket because we would shine our headlamps in there and every time you move your headlamp, it would just, everything would just sparkle right back at you. Um, and during the course of, of excavating this pocket, we started finding these big crystals. The biggest crystal that we saw underground in the pocket was about 15 centimeters across. So it basically doubled the size of the largest known crystal of this material uh, up to this point. Um, and so we had a really great time. This is some of the specimens that, that have come out that we collected during that time. Unfortunately, we only had about three hours to spin there because once the miner was back up, once, once they had finished all of their routine work on it, uh, they started mining again and basically mined through the rest of the pockets, unfortunately. But we, we were able to save some of the really good specimens and find some really nice pieces. So it turns out that this pocket really produced the best, the, the best crystals of this rare mineral ever found. So this is a really nice specimen that came out. Um, uh, another really nice piece. You can see the transparency and the really cool modifications on the crystal faces here. And you actually have alternating. You can't really see it from this angle, but there's another modification there. So you have really cool alternating modifications on the crystals. This is one of the largest crystals that came out intact. Um, as you can see, it's a, probably a little bit over nine centimeters across. So this really set the standard for uh, the, the sulfate mineral here, the quality of the sulfite, sulfate mineral ever found. Uh, some of the pieces also had a little bit of blue in them. You can't really see it too well probably with the, with the background, but the, you can see this is inclusions of blue halite crystals. So you got some funky things going on there as well. And then it also produced these really exquisite groups of crystals that are just coming at every angle. Really, really nice material. Um, best of species that, that came out. Okay, so that's the ephidolite. Now I'm going to get into the halite, um, which is everybody's favorite just because of it. it's so pretty and everything. Um, so this is the Kerr-McGee mine that you see in the picture here. You can see the head frame here. Um, we actually had two. This was basically for ore production. We would haul all of the ore out of this mine. We would, this particular mine, I think we were, we were averaging about 5,000 to 10,000 tons per day um, mining. And then there, you can also see there's, a, there's kind of an, a secondary shaft here, the head frame there, and that's where all the people would go underground and we would drop some equipment and stuff down there. So as you can see, this is quite large. Um, we have the one centimeter scale here. This is the bottom of the shaft, and these are actually quite deep. So uh, from the collar of the shaft, so basically at the top of the shaft to the bottom is 1,700 feet. Uh, so these are very deep mines. It took probably, I would say, about a two and a half minute ride down the man cage to get from the top to the bottom. And as you can see also, you have all these working. So each one of these is a tunnel 
and then we would have our workings in here, our working areas, our, our panels as they were called. But to get from the bottom of the shafts to the collecting area, you can see it was probably about 15 kilometers of driving. You couldn't walk it. Um, well, you could walk it, but it would take you all day to do it. So it really wasn't worth it at that point. And just an inset of the collecting area. And I'll start talking about these in a little bit more detail as we get more into the pictures and everything. Um, but we first started collecting from the north up in here um, and, and had two basically major areas that we were collecting specimens from. So this is actually what we got uh, around in underground. This is called the man trip or the gator. Um, really low slung vehicles because some of the areas are only four or five feet tall. Um, so these were really good vehicles to get around and everything. This is one collecting trip that I took with my boss um, who was a chief mining engineer at the mine. And I first found out about these things from him. I'd always known that there had been blue and, and purple halite from Carlsbad, but I didn't realize the quality of the stuff until I saw a couple of pieces sitting on, his, on, on the back of his desk in his office. And it's like, hey, where did those come from? And he said, well, they came from this mine right here. If you want to, I can take you there. I was working for, uh, um, for the company as an intern at the time in 2007. And the very last weekend that I was there, um, he was able to take me down. And uh, we were able to go collecting in the blue halite room. And this is a picture of the drive back. Um, this particular area had been mined in the, probably the er, late 80s, early 90s. And so it hadn't been in operation since then. So there's a lot of things that change. This, the mines like this, they change a lot more than normal hard rock mines because everything is slowly converging, slowly squeezing shut. At this particular point, we're about 1,700 feet underneath the surface. And that translate to about 1,700 PSI that's being placed on these rocks this far down. So there's a lot of pressure. Because the rock is soft, everything is slowly squeezing shut. Um, so one of the things when we're going back into old areas, we have to check the conditions, the ground conditions. A lot of times what often happens is you have, this is called the back in mining terms or the, uh, or the ceiling. You'll have these big slabs that kind of slowly squeeze shut and sometimes they'll just come down catastrophically. We try, to, we try to design things as mining engineers to avoid that sort of thing, but it does happen every once in a while. So one of the things that we do when we're driving along old tunnels like this or old, or old drifts like this is we'll tap the back with a rock hammer and if you hear a hollow sound, you know not to go in that area. This particular area, fortunately for us, was was pretty nice. Uh, the, the ground was solid and everything, so we didn't have to worry about anything as we were driving back. But one of the cool things that, we use, that you can see here is all these stalactites. And these are old drill holes or bolt holes. We would bolt the roof just to make sure that it held as we were mining it. And, and you'd have water percolating down through the bolt holes and depositing these salt sickles, I like to call them. <laughs> but basically stalactites of salt that kind of form from the ceiling or from the back on down to the floor. So one of the cool things on this particular area, and one of the things that my boss had told me when we first started talking about going back into this area, he, he mentioned the blue room. And, and he was talking about you would be driving along these, these drifts, and all of a sudden you get into this one area and you see just a, a complete wall of blue. And I, I didn't really believe him at the time because you know how things go. Uh, stories really get kind of... It's the same thing as fishing stories, right? Collecting stories kind of follow along the same trends, especially as time further progresses out from the actual event. Um, so I didn't really believe him. But as we were driving back along, along this area, we got into this place where you start to see... Uh, I'll really quickly point out, this is the ore that we typically mine. Um, so it's kind of this brick red color. This is the sylvite, so this has a potassium in it. Uh, this white is also sylvite. Um, but it's a lot more pure in form. And this is where the halite forms. So we, we mined sylvite all over the mine, but it was only in these areas where we had the, the, the really pure white sylvite where we started to see the blue halite crystals. But as we were driving back along this area for the first time, we started seeing these stringers of, of clear and white halite kind of going along the tunnels, or, or the ribs as they're called in mining. And... Uh, these, these start getting bigger and bigger, and we kept on going, driving back, and eventually we start to see something like this. So this is really cool. You get to see this stuff in situ. So you have these sylvite veins, and then you have, these are actually blue halite crystals here that are growing from kind of the normal rock up into the, the condensed sylvite veins. 
Those crystals, probably the one in the center, this one right here, I, say, I would say is about a foot. Um, so pretty good size. And so we drive a little bit more, and, and I'm starting to believe my boss's story more as we drive along. It's like maybe this is not such a wild tale um, to, anyways, to start off with. And we get to this one area where we turn around a corner and we start seeing stuff like this. And you can see the size of the, the, the rock hammer right this, the rock hammer like that. And you can also see the really nice colors, the blues and the purples that this mine was famous for producing uh, back in the day. And, and then we go around another corner and sitting right in the rib, right on the side of the tunnel is this six foot wide by four foot tall blue halite crystal frozen in the sylvite seams. It was the biggest one we've ever seen. We, of course, we tried to get it out, but you know, that's not gonna happen. That thing probably weighed multiple tons at that point. So we, we did our best, but, but we weren't able to get close. But anyways, these things were huge in some places. Like I said, six feet wide was the biggest crystal that we saw. I mean, think about the, the conditions that they had to form. So we saw these really cool crystals. Uh, here's a nice grainy picture. It doesn't look very good, um, but you can actually see uh, the bar, that's probably about four foot bar right there. So these crystals are almost four feet across in this particular area. Um, and one of the interesting things which I can talk about if we have some time is we have these kind of amber cores and they're surrounded by the blue and purple halite where they're contacting the sylvite. I could talk a little bit about the color if we have time at the end of the presentation. Um, but you can see, and when we first got there, we really started working the cleavages, the, the big crystals. But the, because of all the convergence, because of all the pressure placed on these sort of things, um, all the big crystals were basically fragmented. And so we could only find the cleavage fragments, only collect those. And, and our first trips were really uh, spent uh, exploring this particular area and where the big crystals were. Uh, and we got a lot of really cool stuff, really pretty cleavages and stuff, but we hadn't really found crystals that were worth collecting at that point. So that was area one. Um, 2007 to 2008 was right in here. And uh, after I did my internship and went back, I, I was uh, going to school at, at the New Mexico School of Mines or New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. I came back to work once I graduated there in 2010. Um, and so we started exploring this other area up here uh, that started producing a lot more promising looking results. Um, and we started to get into some of the crystals. So this is called the frozen blue area. Um, and you can see the, the, the high grade sylvite veins are not necessarily as big, but it also came uh, with a really added benefit. The, the, sil the halite crystals were smaller, but they're also in much better shape. So this is actually one of the really productive areas. And it's really, a, this sort of experience is really kind of one of those dream come true scenarios um, because as you can see uh, the, this this is actually probably about two feet from from the back to the bottom it was originally at one point about six feet tall uh, so this whole thing is kind of squeezing shut um, over the course of the last 30 years or so but one of the benefits about this sort of convergence is that it spalled a lot of the the ribs off um, and so we had a lot of rock to work and so we would go um, on this sort of stuff and we would just go along the ribs and, and pick up blue halite crystals that were just sitting right on top, top of the ground. We'd just go along and just pick up these things and wrap them up and, and take them back to our man trip. So it was really cool, really a special experience. Uh, just another really cool picture of the, some of the salt sickles in the area. Uh, grainy picture, I'm working on a nice big crystal here. Uh, unfortunately it broke in half once I got it out because it was just a little too big. Um, but the, here's a picture of that. That's probably about seven, eight inches, seven, eight inch crystal. And um, so you guys actually get a really nice treat because most of the time I, this presentation is only about 30 minutes long, but I have a little bit more time. So I've included a video, which I no, normally don't get the chance to show you, but you can actually kind of see uh, how these things are, are forming. And unfortunately, there's no sound, but I can kind of narrate it. This was my collecting buddy that I went with. Uh, we worked together. Um, he was a mine surveyor, and so he would, he would go collecting with me in, in a lot of places. But you can actually see the sylvite seam running across. 
and then frozen in the middle of the sylvite seam are these big halite crystals. And you actually notice that the halite crystal there on the right hand side is fractured mm -hmm. and that's just because of all the convergence pressure that's coming down on top of these things. So we would look for these and they produce really nicely colored cleavage fragments but we would, we would really try to find those zones where we found the smaller crystals that would come out intact. Um, so here I found a, a, a nice piece that's in the, frozen in the sylvite. You can see the crystal is smaller. It actually looks like it's in pretty good condition. And because the rock is soft, these were relatively easy to work out. Um, so I didn't really have a whole lot of padding at the time, so I just used my camera case. You know, you, you got to work with what you have at this point. Um, but one, one of the funny, thing, funny things, I've been field collecting for 30 years. I, I've been doing it a really long time. I have a lot of experience doing that sort of thing. Um, but one of the best things that I've found in field collecting is diapers. They use the diapers to wrap specimens and they really preserve the specimens. Um, but you can see the really nice blue halite crystal that, that just popped right out. And we would find these things all over the place. Um, just, the, just these little crystals. And we basically go along looking for blue flashes as we were crawling around these tunnels. Now here is one of the earlier trips. Um, you can see the back of the gator. Um, and, and you can tell it's one of the earlier trips because you have all of these purple and blue halite cleaves. That, that particular cleavage fragment is probably about like this. They're probably about two feet in diameter. Really nice, really pretty stuff, um, but they weren't crystals. However, uh, we would take buckets down there and basically wrap things in diapers and put our really good specimens in the buckets and take them out that way. Here's a picture of my dad and myself. After a really productive trip, you can see the nice big cleavage fragments at the base um, near our feet. And then you can see the buckets filled with wrapped specimens. And another quick video for you. This is a, a, a really nice or a good trip, productive trip that we had one time. This was all the stuff that we had found. Um, but you can see a, a good number of pieces, crystals of, of varying sizes, but not many crystals over probably, I would say, inch and a half, two inches, just because those crystals had all been fragmented underground already. Um, but you can see really nice stuff. Uh, and one of the things that we had to do a lot of times is these things are growing in white sylvite, so I would have to prep these specimens and, and, and remove selectively, selectively remove some of the sylvite uh, so we can expose the halide on the side. Um, but I just thought I'd like to show you this video. Just, it just gives you an idea of kind of what, this was a, a very good collecting trip we had underground, but, but they produced some really good material over the course of time. So a one inch uh, side cleaved piece would cost how much? So just a cleave, basically if it was say one by one by one, yeah. it's gonna run you about 40 bucks, 50 bucks. Whereas for the crystals, just because they were so much rare, something like this, this is a really nice crystal. Um, these were very uncommon, um, really nice specimens like that. That's gonna run you on the order of probably 1500 to $2,000, just because of the rarity of the crystals. Um, here you can actually see the, the blue halite crystal located within the sylvite, and that took very fine work to try to remove that. I spent hours and hours, my wife can attest, uh, of, of using a, a pick and uh, like a knife just to kind of peel, slowly peel the, the sylvite away. No chemical removal because they're both water soluble. Yep, yep. And then this was a specimen that I had collected that, that I showed you in that video before. And just really quick, um, show you the, the preparation sequence of these things. As you can see, you can see there's a couple of nice crystals here. You got a nice blue crystal here, a nice blue crystal here, and then also one here, which you can't really see too well. Um, but as I said, you kind of slowly work these things and then start to remove the sylvite and expose the halide underneath. Yeah, the, 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 that's one of the nice things. I think there's enough of a difference um, that the energy would not transfer from the sylvite into the halite most of the time. So I could pick these things off and the sylvite would peel off of the halite without damaging the halite at all. Um, so let's get into the pictures. This is one of the really pretty 
cleaves that came out, uh, really beautiful blues and purple colors. Like I said, if we have a little bit of time, I can talk about the color coloring mechanisms a little bit. A really nice big piece that shows the good variety of colors. Some more specimens, uh, just different colors, different patterns, which is really cool. Some showing dissolution features, some, some showing structural features. And then now we get into the crystallized specimens too. Uh, so these came out of the later digging, the later workings. About, like I said, 2011 to 2014 was when the really good pieces came out. Uh, really fine specimen. This was probably the best piece that came out. Um, the, the, the crystal on top, the, the nice crystal, is almost three inches across. This is really another really fine piece. Uh, there, this, the, the crystal on this one is almost four inches. And then you get the really kind of the cool contrasting matrixes as well. So the one on the left, you have the nice white sylvite um, matrix. So a good contrast there. And then the, the one on the right, you have the nice kind of, it's called sylvanite, which is basically a mixture of sylvite and halite, the kind of the reddish matrix that we normally see underground. A couple of other really fine pieces that came out. Uh, the one on the right is in the New Mexico um, Bureau Museum. Some more really nice crystals, getting different shades and different colors, and you can also see the different zoning areas. Um, and then a few of the crystals show these really nice kind of multi-hued or multi-tone zones. But there many of, the, especially the purple, there weren't a whole lot of really nice purple crystals that came out. Most of them were blue. And this was the biggest crystal, intact crystal that came out. This is in the museum now as well. Um, but it's about 10 inches, a little over 10 inches on a side, just a really huge crystal. Most people go into the museum and they think it's Galena or something like that until they get closer and they start to see the blue and then like, whoa, that's, that's huge. That's a big crystal. Is that museum in Socorro? It's in Socorro, yes, yes. Uh, color variation, we got a lot of color var variation as well. And then it's also some other rare minerals that produce some very significant carnalite. Oh, in this particular case, which is, a, I believe, a sodium-potassium chloride. Um, the unfortunate thing about carnalite is it's very deliquescent, so it absorbs moisture and basically will disappear on you into a nice kind of wet puddle over the course of... Even in New Mexico and Arizona, where the climate's dry, it doesn't last very long. It maybe lasts a year or two. Poland, it's not, not going to last. It might last you a couple of days in Poland, yes. Um, also, some really nice, the world's best crystals of langbanite, which is a potassium magnesium sulfate, um, came out. You can see the really nice kind of um, skin tone colors. Here's another crystal of the langbanite, too. Uh, this was one of the ores that we were mining, so we did find a lot of, of these particular minerals um, and crystals. And then some nice sylvite crystals as well. This is one of the bigger ones that came out probably in the 1970s. Um, one, a famous find. It was actually published in the mineral, mineralogical record in the 70s. And some cool combination pieces of halide and sylvite um, from that, the same area as the blue, the blue crystals came from. So future outlook of this particular area or, or these mines. Unfortunately, not long after I left the company to go back to grad school, the mining company decided that they didn't want anybody else collecting there. Um, so they're not allowed to, nobody's allowed to collect. It's basically grounds for firing if, if they find you collecting, which is really an unfortunate policy. Also one of the, I always get this, this question when I'm talking about this sort of thing. People ask, well, can you collect there? It's like, besides the fact that, that the mining company doesn't allow it, uh, these things are slowly squeezing shut on the order of about a half an inch per year. The last time that I went back there in 2014, we had an inch of clearance between the top of our man trip and the back. So at this point, those areas are no longer accessible because everything is squeezed down too far. Um, so unfortunately, blue, blue halite is not going to come out anymore, at least the crystals. There are other, other areas where we found the cleavages, which were pretty nice, but the crystals, unfortunately, are no longer accessible. Ephidolite, we mined through that area back in 2011. Um, so that's no longer available, unfortunately. Um, but there, langbanite is still in production. It's like I said, it's one of the ore minerals, so uh, we should expect to see some more langbanite crystals if they decide to kind of lift, lift those restrictions on collecting policies. Uh, these people were very instrumental in not only collecting, but kind of 
uh, being mentors in my, in my career and everything. So I'd like to thank all these people. Um, and with that, I would like to take questions. Okay, <laughs> I knew I knew that would probably be the first question asked, and I came okay, prepared. Before you reply, uh, you've got slides and all that. I, I have slides for the color. I, I knew he was going to ask it. <laughs> so Dude. It was a deal made before coming. <laughs> no, I just anticipated it. That's that's a, the that's a sign of a good presenter, right? So so it's it's kind of it's a it's a little bit of a complicated process. It's a, it's a two step process, and it really the the first part, the first progress of this, there's a lot of sylvite there, right? Mm -hmm. Sylvite has potassium in it, and where you have large quantities of potassium, you have the naturally radioactive isotope potassium-40. Over the course of time, uh, the potassium-40 breaks down, and so this is the half-life is 1.25 billion years, uh, so it breaks down over the course of time, releases a little bit of gamma radiation. That gamma radiation then basically this is a structure of sylvite, but it, the same principle applies to halite as well. The, the gamma radiation knocks an electron off of one of the chlorine ions that is kind of floating around within the crystalline structure. Um, that electron then is transferred, knocked into, into kind of, I wouldn't say orbit, but just kind of knocked around the crystal structure. Eventually, it occupies a crystal vacancy within the lattice, um, which is this electron right here. Now that in, in itself does not produce the blue color, that actually produces a kind of brown color. And if you remember that picture from, the, from uh, one of the earlier pictures, I had that big halite crystal with the bar right next to it. You notice there was kind of an amber center, and then right along the outside you had the blue kind of rim, or the, the blue rind that was in touch with the sylvite. So it produces, that the color defect, or known as a farba center, produces the amber coloration. But also over the course of time, eventually you'll get to the point where you have these electrons. Uh, they, want to, they want to join up with something. They have a charge, so they want to become, uh, they, they basically want to form with uh, the sodium. Like I said, this is potassium, but the same thing applies to sodium. Um, they, they like to join with the sodium, and basically that process forms sodium metal, elemental sodium, in a, with no charge attached to it at all. And, and these, over the course of time, will also kind of aggregate or, or clump together these, these sodium, they're called colloids. And these groups of sodium colloids are what actually get the, give the, the halite color its blue color, the, the, the halite the blue color. And so I, I like to ask the question, what happens when you mix blue and brown together? What color do you get as a result? Purple. You get purple, <laughs> right? So, so you, if you noticed, and, and some of my previous slides when I was showing kind of the color variation that some of the, the specimens were purple. And that's, that's the combination between the two kind of phenomenon where you have the colloidal sodium giving it the blue color and then the color centers giving it the brown color. And that combination gives it the purple. And actually Virgil, who's the curator of the museum and also um, he, does, he writes a lot of papers and everything, Virgil Luth, um, we did an experiment to test this out and we took... Uh, a purple cleave and we stuck it under UV radiation because that will eventually restore the color center over the course of time. And so we did an experiment over the course of, a, of 48 hours. We had it on for 48 hours and I don't think, I think I removed that slide um, last night. I wish I kind of would have left it. But, but we did that test and over the course of 48 hours we actually photo documented from something going from like a nice deep purple color all the way to blue as that color structure, this, the color center was restored. So that's really, I think, a confirmation of this theory that it's the combination of these two different phenomena. So then you're saying, in theory, then, that all the blue ones will eventually turn? All the purple ones will eventually turn blue okay. if you expose them to UV radiation. So if you stick them outside. Now, granted, the, the, the light that we use was very strong, yeah. very powerful. Um, so it would take a long time for you to notice changes. I think I, I did an experiment myself, which didn't really turn out to, into, into much, um, where I stuck a, a halite cleave out for two or three weeks and I didn't notice any change in the sunlight. Um, but over the course of time, you would expect to see purple halite kind of turn a, a really nice blue shade as those color centers are restored. So are there any halite crystals which are half embedded in the sylvite? 
of the color and whatnot? That's a really great question. We actually found some pieces. I think I kept one of the pieces in my collection where we had halite crystals that were growing right next to sylvite crystals. And, and the, 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 where the, where the, so, so basically we had a sil one big halite crystal probably about like this, and then half of it was covered by halite, half of it was covered by sylvite. The half that was covered by halite had no color, whereas the half that was covered by sylvite had nice blue color because of the radiation damage from the potassium 40. And so everything that's contacting, Right, that, so, so everything that was con contacting the sylvite has that really nice kind of blue-purple color. And that's another confirmation that we have that process going along. It was a radiation damage that was lending to that color. Any more questions? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Hey, like, I mean, it tastes like I, I've, I've uh, ingested like plenty salt. of it. Tastes like salt. Um, the sylvite, on the other case, if you haven't ever tasted sylvite, um, it, 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 it tastes kind of salty as well, but it actually has a bite to it. It has kind of a tang to it. And actually, if, if you think about it, some of the, some of the, uh, the sports drinks like Gatorade, that sort of thing, they actually put a little bit of sylvite in it um, because it gives it that kind of that, that weird taste. But, but it's kind of it's replenishing your electrolytes that you naturally process in your body. But you, it kind of has a little bit of a, a different taste than what you'd expect from, from halite. But when you actually, when you lick a sylvite crystal or something like that, it, it's, it's pretty noticeable. It, it will bite your tongue. So, the, I'm glad you answered that question because I also came prepared. So... <laughs> So, I don't believe in <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I wanted to go through this because curation is a very important thing when it comes to hygroscopic minerals. Um, Ephthidolite is very stable. It's actually kind of in the name. That's the, the, Latin, um, the Latin origin for the word is stable salt or stable in air salt. So ethidolite itself is very stable. Carnalite, like we mentioned before, it will disappear on you no matter where you live. Halite is relatively stable. It, it is unstable when you basically you get above 75 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, above 75% relative humidity. It's so in hot, in yeah. So so in hot, <laughs> in hot humid environments, um, you really have to be careful. I know some people. I, I've I've had a couple of people that bought specimens and, and they live in Houston and they seem to have a pretty good. Uh, track record with, with it as long as they, they what they usually do is put it in a sealed container and put some desiccant in the bottom to kind of remove the moisture out of that and it seems to work pretty well that way but it is it is unstable in, in hot humid environments so you have to be careful about that. Langbanite, um, I showed you some of the really pretty crystals that we found there they're pretty unstable even in New Mexico eventually they'll they'll alter to a mineral called leonite uh, which is kind of a white crusty mineral it's not very attractive so usually what i do is i cover them in some sort of acrylic um, there's something called polyvinyl acetate that i use to treat the specimens as well um, sylvite is also relatively stable although it's not quite as stable as halite itself um, so you have to be careful with the sylvite um, and then the sylvanite matrix um, which you'll see on a lot of the specimens with the blue halite cubes i usually stabilize that uh, with the polyvinyl acetate as well uh, so you just really have to be cognizant of, of your atmosphere, of where you are, um, and then of, of what, what each mineral will do. But basically, I would say halide and sylvite are relatively stable unless, in, unless they're in really hot, humid environments. You guys got perfect timing to come for this. <laughs> and, and I promise that's the last of my slides. <laughs> Any more secret questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.